Hello, everybody. Hello again uh, to all of you who participated in the events uh, yesterday and on Friday. Uh, my name is Niklas Oppenrieder. I am the medical director of the Physicians Association for Nutrition, PAN International, and I would like to welcome you very warmly on behalf of the whole VegMed Consortium, the um, Charité University Outpatient Clinic for Integrative Medicine at the Emanuel Hospital in Berlin, ProVeg International, the Reformhaus Fachakademie, Academy, and PAN itself. So we already had two exciting events. We uh, discussed the impact of uh, food on chronic disease with Dr. Walter Willett on Friday. We had a very lively interview with Dr. Greger and Jens Tudor yesterday on the topic of pandemics and their uh, connection with food and food systems. Um, and we're about to attend uh, another uh, exciting panel discussion. Um, and uh, VegMed and PAN will provide you with more online events throughout the whole year 2020. Um, but this is, of course, not really comparable, at least in my humble opinion, um, with the real thing with uh, VegMed conference in Berlin, um, with its three days packed of science, practical learnings, some of the most renowned speakers um, in the field, um, and maybe more importantly, uh, even um, healthy, delicious food, um, great new relationships, great new networks, um, and springtime in beautiful Berlin, in and around the beautiful Henry Ford building. Um, so um, we got a new date. So this all is uh, possible again next year, 2021. Um, 28, uh, February 28th till March 2nd will be the next VegMed conference. And uh, some of you may have noticed that this time the conference will be on um, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. So this might give you two more days in the uh, plant-based capital in Berlin. So we would be happy to see all of you at Europe's largest conference, uh, on Europe's largest medical conference on plant-based nutrition next year. Um, so for today, make sure to use the Q&A. If you have any questions for the speakers, please write them in the Q&A box. Uh, we will uh, select some questions and um, today we will definitely have some time to get to a few of these questions. Um, yeah, so feel free to uh, use this Q&A box. Uh, sorry. All right. So, as I said, we had NCDs, we had pandemics in the last two days. Uh, and today we're going to do a deep dive into the topic of climate change, health and food uh, with a great panel discussion. Your host today will be Dörte Eichelbeck, uh, author, director and uh, TV host at Arte and Xenius, among others, who deals with, um, due to her work, a lot of topics of sustainability and uh, will be a great host. So I hand over the mic to Dörte. Thank you very much. Hello, I hope everybody can see me now. <laughs> Thank you very much, Niklas, for this world-class introduction. Um, and thank you for, um, to ProVeg and uh, the whole consortium to set up this event so that uh, today, uh, we can get a taste of uh, what we can expect um, at VegMed next year. And um, I'd like to introduce our speakers or say hello to them as well. They, they will appear on the screen later on. Uh, Dr. Marco Springman, Dr. Martin Herrmann and Dr. Christian Kessler. So um, the questions that you can type in into the chat room will be collected by our second facilitator, Julia Schneider, and uh, we can sprinkle them in um, towards the end of our discussion. Um, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, I hope you're are you okay with that? Um, it will be recorded so that it is available on social media later on. Um, so now um, I would like to see if uh, Marco Springman is already there. Ha! There you are. And you're sitting. Yes. <laughs> 
Because uh, I don't know who of you guys have followed uh, last night's uh, webinar. I found this quite amusing um, to see uh, the, the, the speaker, Michael Greger, on the treadmill. Uh, so that's a quite efficient way to make use of your time if you're very busy at these times right now. Have you, have you considered this as well, Michael? Yeah, that's a good home? idea. I actually have my exercise uh, plank uh, sitting over there. So usually when I walk around, I do a couple of things. <laughs> Yeah, it was also. You got, you got to stay fit for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was also considering of uh, I don't know combining my daily practice of yoga with uh, hosting uh, webinars, but I'm not sure if you guys want to see this. So yeah, we better stay seated <laughs> and leave it to the experts. So Marco, uh, you are a, you are a senior researcher on environmental sustainability and public health at the Oxford University. And um, you would like to uh, tell us a little bit about um, the um, impact of our diet on the current climate crisis. So um, what can you tell us about that, first of all? Well, the uh, way we eat uh, has really a major impact on climate change. According to the latest estimates by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the food system is responsible for up to a third of all greenhouse gas emissions. So it's really a major driver of climate change. Um, so let, let me just hang on here because I, I assume that most of the people who follow this webinar right now are aware of this issue, but let's just quickly um, sum up what you mean with uh, the responsibility of uh, the third of uh, that, that uh, impact. That's quite a lot. Like, how does that happen? Yeah, that is really a lot. So if you think where those occurred, and there are three principal components to that impact. So one of the very big impacts is um, uh, uh, fertilizer use. So when we grow any food, we usually fertilize it. Um, and while fertilizing foods, um, a very potent greenhouse gas called nitrous oxide is created. And uh, that basically warms, uh, warms the atmosphere. Then the second component is a direct component that is primarily associated with ruminant animals. Uh, so when, for example, cows or sheep eat grass that potentially before has been fertilized, or they eat some grain mix that has been fertilized, uh, that already has a, a climate change component. But whilst they digest it in their multiple stomachs, uh, another potent greenhouse gas called methane is produced. So that's the second component. And then a third component is carbon dioxide that we hear about all the time. And obviously on a farm, you have use of machinery, you have uh, the whole industrial processes, processes that produce, for example, fertilizers, but you also have land use changes. And specifically for, uh, again, animal source foods, those make a big contribution because uh, what you heard maybe from uh, the Amazon, uh, recently um, with all those wildfires. I mean, a couple of those or some proportion of those were indeed caused by farmers who wanted to make way both for pastures to have animals on or for soybean plantations. And those are usually GM soy uh, plantations that are there. So they go exclusively uh, to animal feed uh, and they feed our pigs, chicken, and a little bit uh, um, uh, cows as well. So those are the three components that are responsible for the uh, climate change impact of the food system. But these three components um, are mainly caused by the mass production of meat, right? By factory farming. Well, yes and no. So if you think about the methane uh, emissions, uh, we have some good comparisons between grass fed and grain fed uh, animals. And uh, it turns out that actually uh, grass-fed uh, cows produce more methane uh, per, per product. Uh, now, the reason for that is that usually grass-fed uh, cows live a bit longer, so they're, they have more time to basically produce those emissions whilst not putting on more, more weight, for example. Um, so th there are a couple of reasons why, why that is, but uh, you can't necessarily say that um, you know, like uh, that uh, there is a great difference between mass produced and not mass produced. It's only that mass produced uh, emits more at the moment because there is just more of that, right? But for example, we made a uh, model analysis where we looked, what is if you max out what you can produce on pastures, right? 
Uh, so you just say, okay, we don't put more on pastures. We just leave what, it, what there is to not put more pressure. And, but what there is, we try to max out. So we convert every, every cow herd into a combined beef and dairy herd, for example. Then it turns out that, that uh, meat production would be very low, but milk production could be fairly high. And if you, again, use what we know about the emissions associated with those products, uh, and indeed also very often the, the grass is also fertilized. It's not like that grows for free uh, necessarily. So if you use the footprints that are there, then that might also tip us over what would be regarded as a safe limit to stay within the two degree target, for example, let alone the 1.5 degree target. Wow, so um, what should the result be then? Should we all turn vegan now? That sounds like quite a, that's yeah. quite, a uh, quite a mission to sure turn everybody vegan. Sure it is. I mean, <laughs> according to our analysis, obviously a completely plant-based diet would be the lowest in greenhouse gas emissions. So mm -hmm. that is, um, and it's not only according to our analysis, literally every analysis that is out there comes to that conclusion. Um, whilst it could also be one of the healthiest if you do it carefully. Um, but um, we found that you don't necessarily have to go completely vegan. So if you go to a flexitarian diet that only includes animal products on occasion, and with the on, uh, on occasion, I really mean on occasion, like for example, not having more than one serving of red meat per week, uh, and red meat includes beef, pork, and lamb. Um, having not more than two servings of poultry per week, um, having not more than two servings of fish per week. And if you have milk, not having more than one serving of milk per day. And that includes, um, that, is, uh, that is in milk equivalent. So it's not milk and cheese, it's milk or cheese, for example. So if you stick to those broad uh, guidelines, roughly, then uh, globally, we found that we could indeed stay on that two degree trajectory where we wouldn't, where the food system wouldn't contribute more than it's supposed to contribute to that, uh, uh, to that target. Okay. Um, are there measurements apart from um, the measures in the area of nutrition um, that are highlighted a little bit too much maybe in this whole discussions, maybe um, the importance of certain aspects that are maybe exaggerated? Yeah, there are a couple of things that come up over and over. So one of the things that comes up is transport. So people mm -hmm. always think, oh, you should really eat local and transport is very bad. But if you look globally again, then you see that uh, transport of food products is responsible for less than 5% of the overall food related climate change impact. So it's really small. And the reason for that is that most of the time, literally, if food companies can, they, they ship everything and you can load an awful lot of stuff on a boat. So hardly anything is, air, uh, is flown. Um, so chances are whatever you consume, if it's not like the most exotic fruit, then it would have been transported by boat. And that doesn't contribute hardly anything. Uh, so just for a comparison, if you compare, let's say a high emitting um, uh, one kilogram of beef, right? Which is amongst the highest emitting food products then you have roughly a, 10, a factor difference of 10 to uh, other um, animal products like pork or poultry. And then again, you have a difference of a factor of 10 to plant-based protein sources like uh, beans, lentils. Um, so it, uh, that means you have a really, really big difference that can't really be bridged by those small differences that, tra that transport would make, right? So uh, for example, even if let's say you buy lentils that were produced in Canada, right? That would, would not affect that uh, emissions impact of those lentils by, uh, by a factor of anything, right? It might be like 10% or so, but it wouldn't go to uh, basically a thousand percent that you would need to go even to uh, an animal uh, source food. Um, and the second thing that is always highlighted is plastic, maybe, right? Uh, lots of people are concerned about plastic packaging um, and probably not so much because of climate change, but because plastic uh, might end up in oceans. Uh, but also there in high income countries, there is really not much indi uh, indication that the plastic that is thrown away there ends up in the oceans. That is mostly single use plastic in lots of Asian countries. 
So what we throw away is either, either burnt or, la uh, or ends up in landfill. And you might criticize that, uh, sure, but uh, it's, uh, it's definitely not uh, a big of a contributor to the climate crisis as, uh, uh, as the types of food we eat. It's interesting, though, that in that whole discussion about the climate change, um, it's always the carbon emissions of transportation of travels mainly that mm. is being um, mentioned as the main indicator and most of the people don't actually know about um, the impact of um, our whole let's say um, animal product industry so what what do you think why is that like why don't we know about this oh. Um, uh, yeah, that's uh, up to anybody's guess, I suppose. I mean, not long time, <laughs> not long time ago, the primarily pri primary focus in this whole discussion about climate change was really on the production side. Uh, and uh, if you look at the production side, uh, food uh, or diets is a consumption thing, right? It doesn't really pop up when you look at the consumption side. What you see there is. Uh, energy use, uh, you know, you see all those coal-fired power plants, for example, popping up, and you see the transport sector, you see maybe agriculture, but uh, in the official statistics, um, the impacts of agriculture are assessed in quite a funky way. So anything that has to do with machinery use in agriculture doesn't pop up in agriculture, it pops up in that machinery and transport in, in uh, electricity generation. So only if you go to a consumption accounting, um, then you suddenly see what big impact the food system has. So I think those are really uh, yeah, structural drivers that prevented us from looking at it in a more holistic way. Mm -hmm. So you've uh, mentioned already um, what uh, some nutritional uh, recommendations to us as consumers. So um, what can health professionals do to um, uh, influence or to, to, to implement these uh, recommendations of yours? Well, I think very often health professionals are sort of trusted, uh, trusted mediators in, in some sense, right? Um, uh, I mean, I suppose it's not very often that uh, health professionals choose to highlight very much the impacts of diets on health, mm -hmm. although we know in terms of prevention, it can really have a major impact. According to um, the global burden of disease, dietary ill health uh, um, uh, and uh, related to dietary risk factors like not eating enough fruits and vegetables or eating too much red and processed meat, it's responsible for up to a third of all uh, deaths globally and in most regions. So uh, if health professionals would highlight a little bit more what a healthier diet would look, look like, uh, I think that could really go quite a big way towards both uh, preventing disease cases before they occur and to get people to adopt a more sustainable diet. Um, of course, it's a bit complicated when people come to their, uh, go to doctors, they usually have already an issue, right? But uh, if at least health professionals uh, have some information at hand that they could direct uh, their patients uh, towards, uh, then that could make a difference maybe. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Marco Springmann. I can already tell that more and more questions are popping up directed to you. So we'll get back to that uh, towards the end of our discussion. And now um, I'd like to hand over to our second speaker, to Martin Herrmann, um, uh, Dr. Ha Martin Herrmann, to be precise, uh, who is the chairman um, of KLUG, Deutsche Allianz Klimawandel und Gesundheit e.V., or in, in English, <laughs> the German Alliance on uh, Climate Change and Health and Climate Change and Health, and also Health for Future. And um, Martin is a medical doctor specialized on transformational change, and uh, he has worked uh, as a consultant for uh, Gavi, the Global Vaccine Alliance, and for the World Health Organization. So, um, Martin, um, now with you, I guess we'll talk about the big picture as well, um, uh, given your uh, scientific background. Um, and uh, you like to talk about uh, the planetary health emergency um, 
and to stress the fact that um, that whole crisis we are going um, that, that's going on right now is just one of many crises. So um, why is it so important to talk about that health emergency now? I mean, until last year, people were very shy also in the climate movement to talk about that we have a crisis. But even the World Economic Forum was uh, talking about that we are sleepwalking into catastrophe because of the risks we are encountering by crossing the planetary boundaries. And it is clear by now that climate change and biodiversity loss represent the biggest risks for our civilization. The risk to irre irreversibly alter the natural systems and creating suffering for all beings beyond imagination. I think what we are learning now in a crisis is that a pandemic, when you hear about it first, it doesn't sound so bad. When you're in it and you see the second and third order implications of a, local, of a global shutdown, you have a very different understanding of what this is about. And I think it's important when we now look at the climate and biodiversity crisis that uh, uh, what we are talking about, I mean, uh, Marco was talking about the two, per, uh, two degree we are trying to stay below as part of the Paris Agreement. Now we are on a trajectory to go three, four, five, six degree up. And uh, this is clearly a catastrophe. And it's very important to be aware that we are on no way in, on a trajectory that uh, is limiting the risk. We are still continuing to adding risk to where we are. And the second point, I think, why do I talk about a health crisis, a planetary health emergency? I think it's important to understand when we are in the process of destroying the platform on which we live, when we destroy kind of what we depend on and future uh, generations depend on, this is not very healthy. And even today, across the planet, we see that hunger and malnutrition is going up. Natural disasters are getting much more frequent. You just need to take, get back to the pictures of Australia or the Amazon or Siberia, all the fires and the storms we had in the last 12 months. Heat is leading to tens of thousands of premature deaths each year and hundreds of thousands and millions of people suffering, suffering severely. Pandemics are getting more fre frequent. Pollen allergies are occurring all year round. Infectious diseases like Zika, malaria, tick bites, dengue and others are on the rise. And this is not a complete list. So this is not happening kind of in five years or 10 years, this is happening now. And the consequences are also connected to migration, violence and war, and the overburden already weak health system, especially in the global south. south. The most vulnerable are also the most affected. And also here in Germany, hundreds of thousands of people are already suffering of the consequences. So it's not something that is only happening to the polar bears, once you understand the systems as uh, the symptoms and you talk to friends, you talk to neighbors, you look into your family, you see that your grandmother might be affected, that your child might be affected, that yourself might be affected already. And it's very important to really see that it's happening here. It's not happening somewhere else. Because when you diagnose an emergency, it is a clear call for very strong and direct action. So um, you, you, um, you actually want us to treat all these crises that you have uh, mentioned as an urgency. Um, and well, quite obviously, we are going through a crisis right now uh, since you mentioned uh, the pandemic before. So I finally I have to uh, mention the C word. And now I don't talk about climate. I talk about Corona. Um, do you think that uh, the current Corona crisis, crisis is also uh, kind of a result of all what happened before? Um, I mean, you probably have seen there that there are many scientists pointing to that the connections to the, uh, of pandemics to the way we are treating nature. 
that uh, natural resources are getting smaller and smaller. We are kind of uh, destroying soil. We are leaving less kind of places for, for nature and wild animals. And uh, it is clear that through that the pandemic uh, risk is rising. Now, with regard to the corona crisis, how much of this is the case or not, it's not me to judge. But it is also clear in this crisis that we are seeing the weakness of many health systems and we are seeing the weaknesses that we're exposed to because of the global supply chains we have and the dependencies we have on each other. And I think that's a very important thing to take into account. It's also getting clear that when you have a health crisis, there's a risk or you have to stop many other things because without health, all the other things are not really valid. And uh, I think what there is also learning about that if you take a crisis serious, um, that we can do that, that we are willing to do that. And I think that's something we need to take from that for how we treat the climate crisis because uh, with a, with a Medical narrative, I would say, is a pandemic now is more like an emergency that perhaps will last for two or three years. But then when you treat an emergency as a doctor, you also need to look at the other symptoms of the planet in this case and see how you address the longer term issues also in your short term answers. And it is very clear that the longer term risks are even more heavy than what we are confronting right now. Okay, um, so can you give us an idea um, what health professionals can do about this now? I think it's important to be aware that until very recently, climate change, especially in Germany, wasn't an issue in the health sector. Mm. Until one year ago, there were very few people really focusing on it. So this is slowly starting to change. But it's very important that it changes fast because I would say the moment we as health professionals stand up and make it a clear case, this will be heard because we are a very powerful um, professions. We are from all the professions, we have the highest reputation. And uh, also when we talk about health, it, has, it, re it reaches people much more directly than any other case. And I also want to point to that so far in the climate movement and the climate NGOs have mostly focused on um, energy, on the science, on transport, on travel, um, but they haven't very much focused on health. And I think that's a big mistake because with health you reach people. So I'm very positive that if we as the health professionals takes the diagnosis that is clear, serious, and speak it clearly, it can be a game changer. That's why I really invite everyone who is a health professional and also the other people who are concerned to really look into the health argument and spread the word and be very explicit and outspoken when we are in public. I think um, one of the challenges about um raising awareness for uh, the current climate crisis is that the overall effects of it are long term. So um, they're, they're more abstract. And, uh, but are there some short, time, short term effects, um, talking about health issues, uh, that you can bring up to warn people so that they can take this topic more seriously? For example, heat you can bring up every year when we have heat waves, 5,000 people and more are dying prematurely and hundreds of thousands of people are suffering here in Germany. Yeah, you can use allergies. So there are many, many examples of things that are already happening here. And there's a, one other very important point. When we take climate protection serious, we have tremendous health benefits. So when we eat differently, when we use a planetary health diet, it's much more healthy for us. And it's the best way to fight against the non-communicable disease uh, pandemics that we have worldwide. If we are more actively mobile, if we walk and cycle, it's very good for our health. If we take things a bit more easy and have being enough being enough, so that you don't need always more and more and more, 
it's actually leading to a less stressful life. It will lead to better relations and so on and so forth. So it's very important that when we go the path that is recommended for climate protection, we have nothing to lose. It's not a sacrifice. It's actually the path to a good life. And that's a message that we as health professionals can spread. So it's not about uh, a miserable life. It's about celebrating life, but also being recognizing what a wonderful gift we have to be here alive on this planet, this unique jewel in the universe. Okay, and, and now, um, before we um, gather up the questions that are piling up for you as well towards the end of this talk, um, can you quickly talk to, uh, to us about a little bit about Klug, uh, what um, your aim and your mission is um, of this initiative? So maybe to give some idea to the health professionals out there, how they can actually maybe get inspired by this. I mean, basically it was coming, we, we were founding Klug because we saw the topic is not an issue in the German health sector. And we want to make it a priority. And we want to make sure that we as health professionals are taking the lead in climate action. And we will all also want to spread the word that when we change the affairs, we don't need a majority. We need three to 4% of the players to be change agents, to not just observing or reading or knowing, but to get active, to get on the playground, to change your own behavior, but also to be active strategically on a political level, like some of our ancestors, like guys like Virchow or Pettenkofer, when they did change the uh, uh, political system in the 19th century, they were our predecessors. And I think we can come back to this kind of spirit to be out there. And I just, when we, for example, have made actions in public, in front of the Siemens shareholder value meeting with our white coats and with the planet on a wheelchair, people would come to us and photograph us. We were in Tagesschau and other places because it's a very strong picture. So if we stand up with our reputation, we can be a game changer. And I think it's really important that many, many people join Health for Future and join Clue. And as one of the things that we are doing out of this commitment is in 10 days, there will be the first uh, German uh, planetary health lecture series starting. So you can, uh, I think Nick will, will, uh, will, will, will mention this later, how you can, can go there, which will give you all the information you need to be a change agent, because that's the invitation that we are not just knowing about it, but that we are changing our way of looking at it, being a driver for the change that is needed. Okay, thank you very much, Martin Hermann. So talking about um, getting active, um, so I'd like to uh, hand over to the third speaker, uh, who is um, the co-founder of Vegemet and uh, the research coordinator at the Charity Clinic for Integrative Medicine at Emanuel Hospital, Dr. Christian Kessler, hello. Hi. Um, so Christian, you work with patients every day. Um, so tell us a little bit how, what you do to make a change here. Hmm. Yeah, so um, being a clinician and being a clinical researcher, um, you know, we often have to go down um, uh, pragmatic uh, ways because um, by theory only and by um, dogmatism and extremism, um, you know, the reality teaches us, um, you know, this tough lesson that it hardly ever works to, to win over people for your agenda. So often, it's a, it's a stepwise process. And I always tell patients, you know, every step into the, into the right direction is a good step. So sometimes um, you have to start slowly. Um, other patients are more receptive, more open. And, and oftentimes uh, also depends on the condition that they're in. You know, we experience that people with uh, tough health conditions um, are often very grateful for, uh, for nutritional interventions, you know, such as an introduction into flexitarianism or, or plant-based nutrition uh, or, or fasting interventions, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, but it all boils down, um, or at least most of the time, to, uh, to own experiences. With patients, this is, this is the lesson from my uh, past uh, uh, about 15 years of, uh, of being a medical doctor. Um, it's all about experiencing a change um, 
uh, you know, facilitate it through the interventions that you agree to uh, as per your lifestyle and as per nutrition. So um, if people have a good reason uh, for change and if doctors and, and other health uh, professionals explain well and um, are um, empathetic in the way, uh, you know, they explain, you know, what the patients um, could do, should do, um, then the patients are much more likely to follow uh, such suggestions and, um, you know, in the end, they benefit from it. Um, uh, uh, they lose a, a lot of their um, disease burden. Um, they, uh, they see a reduction of symptoms, a betterment um, of their cause of disease. They can reduce uh, dosages of uh, particular uh, uh, drugs. They lose weight. Um, you know, their diabetes... Uh, and uh, uh, their uh, blood fat uh, values and uh, several other lab values, you know, get better um, over uh, over the the coming weeks and months. So this is all and this is all about experiencing the change that you are part of as a patient, and um, it requires a large degree um, of empathy um, and um, of uh, uh, of mindfulness on the side of the physician and on the side of uh, 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 the uh, the medical professionals and it's all about experience it's less about you know uh, pure theory and um, and numbers and figures when we're talking about the bedside scenario yeah or the ambulance setting um, or the clinic setting okay so um i think that's a good idea to talk um, uh, about uh, diets with your patients that's uh, uh, that's true it's something that lots of physicians don't do um, um, what else can be done um, from your point of view maybe uh, in terms of addressing the CEOs of hospitals uh, or medical students or chief uh, physicians mm. I was actually very I was actually very touched by what uh, Martin just said previously in terms of you know uh, the need for reductionism, at least this is what I understood from uh, something that he said um, earlier. And that's obviously a very necessary point, you know, um, uh, taking the lesson from, you know, the climate uh, crisis, but also from the corona fallout um, and several other global crises, um, we see that this narrative of, um, uh, of eternal growth um, economy is something that's uh, fundamentally wrong for the planet. Yeah, and you don't have to be a socialist or a communist or a tree hugger, you know, or whatever uh, to understand this. And, you know, this is really surfacing right now and in all these crises, habitat destruction. I don't have to repeat it. It has all been said earlier by Martin and, uh, and, and Marco, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the wildfires uh, globally, uh, everything that goes, uh, uh, that goes on uh, in, in the context of the climate crisis, you know, we need to not only change our habits, uh, not only change our nutrition, uh, you know, get more active in terms of physical activity or fly less, we have to reduce almost everything in terms, uh, you know, if we want to save this, uh, this planet. And I find it, um, uh, I find it, difficult even, you know, to handle with, um, you know, new terminology like green growth or sustainable growth, uh, you know, looking at, um, uh, at least in Germany, important figures like Nico Pech, you know, we also have to get away uh, from this uh, within the sustainability community and also within the plant-based community, you know, that, uh, you know, we can stay in our comfort zone, you know, whether we're doctors or researchers or patients or whoever, you know, we can just uh, change our diet from red to green, but continue to uh, to be part of the eternal growth story. You know, uh, permanent growth in medicine, you know, we almost only see uh, in oncology, you know, and everywhere else in nature. You know, of course, we see a lot of growth, but we also see a lot of um, uh, of, of non-growth in nature, you know, and of cycles of growth and non-growth, you know, and of recovery. Um, but um, our economic... Um, a problem, you know, coming back to your question and uh, coming back to you know, the question of CEOs of hospitals is that also in the medical arena, in the healthcare sector, we, is, we, we are seeing a scenario where healthcare has become a business like almost every other business. 
and the rationales that drive healthcare in most countries on this planet uh, by now are um, are uh, uh, are pure business rationales. You know, this is probably a slight ex uh, exaggeration, but um, uh, we all see it working in the healthcare sector. We all we're uh, most of the time in leading positions. You're talking about numbers. You're talking about uh, margins, revenues, like as if you were on the on a stock market. You know, and hospital, big hospital change, uh, 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 hospital um, uh, groups are owned. Um, uh, by uh, uh, by big uh, companies or by um, by funds, etc. So this is a fundamental problem, and the CEOs have to follow this law. So sometimes it's quite difficult to get through with the very necessary messages of you know uh, 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 changing uh, people's diet, uh, not only for medical reasons but also for planetary health reasons. You know for for medic for planetary health reasons and um, and uh, you know this uh, planetary emergency, but also for sustainability reasons, for for climate reasons. Um, so also with CEOs, you know, um, we have to use um, this um, all these not only this but all these emergencies like the climate uh, crisis, uh, like the Corona. Um, uh, pandemic to wake up these people and um, we're seeing this everywhere and and I feel um, that this is actually um, Corona uh, for example is not only bad in the sense that this is also a big opportunity um, to to reboot um, some of the fundamental problems that um, um, uh, that uh, have come into existence over the last um, uh, decades and centuries, um, and this is a good uh, 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 a good chance to think over um, some of our basic um, sort of almost axiomatic uh, narratives, beliefs, you know, in terms of eternal growth um, and. Um, and uh, in German, we say Wegwerfgesellschaft, you know, just throw it away, buy something. Uh, if you don't like it, throw it away, buy something new. And, um, you know, if, 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 you're, uh, if you're a green follower of this idea, you know, you just uh, buy something green. And if you don't like it, you know, you throw it away and buy something green new. Yeah? But this also doesn't work. And this has to be explained to everybody, not only to physicians and patients, but also to CEOs and um, uh, to stakeholders everywhere, because this is a, an excellent chance um, for change management and a clarion call for action that um, we're deep in the red zone of, of almost everything on a planetary scale. And um, if we want to heal the planet, we have to go into a reduction mode everywhere and not change from here to there only. Wow, Christian, thank you so much. Um, that was actually the perfect bridge to uh, <laughs> all these questions coming in uh, from our viewers. Um, I think uh, you couldn't hear me, but you could, uh, and you couldn't see me nodding my head. Um, so um, let me um, uh, actually address the first question to the whole panel. So Marco, you can also switch on your video and your uh, audio again. Um, so the first question by, um, by the way, thank you to everybody for your questions. The first one is, um, do the speakers think that the necessary changes in health and climate can take place in the cur current political system? Do we need a system change? <laughs> um, yes, we do need a system change because we need a radical change, but what this will look like, no one really knows because I think it's very important, we will have to have the courage to act into the unknown. And we can see it now in the crisis that we have a lot of uncertainty. And when we start with climate action, there will not this be this one big plan from system A to system B, but there will be a starting point where we start to act on certain things that are quite obvious. And then there will be a crisis popping up that no one was expecting and we have to rearrange and we will learn things and we have to rearrange. And I also don't think that there will be one system across the planet. 
But many of the things kind of Marco was talking about, or Christian was talking about, will be elements of what we are moving towards, which is that growth cannot be the imperative. It is an option in certain phases, but it's not kind of an axiom that you always need to follow. It not, can't be an ideology or that we, it is more like a freedom to use a planetary health diet because it is a very obvious thing to do once you understand your planetary responsibility. This will have different tastes in all places and all different speeds, but uh, yes, we need a system change because what we are having as a system is killing us. So that's not a good way to stay with it. Uh, I just want to add one thing to, to uh, Christian because this might lead to, to misunderstandings. I don't think we need everybody. We should communicate trying to reach many, but it's really important. You need a critical minority to turn things around. Mm. You don't need the majority. But turning things around means the minority goes on the playground and is playing hardball. It's really taking it serious. Because if you look at history, like uh, uh, social changes, women rights, any other thing started with a few crazy guys. And they also were usually not on the upside of the hierarchy. They were somewhere in the woods. So every one of us is a change agent and can be the player who turns things around. And there will not be one big change. There can be millions of little micro transformations with patients in a team, in my family, in many, many places. So uh, yes, we will need system change. It's possible, it's not probable. It's also very important. It's an uphill struggle, but it also makes it exciting. So, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, well, I, I just wanted, to, uh, well, you know, I wanted to refer to what uh, Einstein said. I don't know if the English translation is actually the correct one, but in German it would sort of go like, uh, you know, problems um, cannot be solved with the tools that have created them. Yeah. And I think this is so fundamentally true. And um, uh, if, uh, if we let the people who navigated us into this crisis, um, uh, uh, let us try and navigate out of the crisis only, you know, then, then we're in trouble. Of course, we need all these people and we need their experience, but we also need new and fresh ideas. And um, we, we, we do need, as I said, you know, a reboot of the system at least. I don't know whether we need a completely new system, but we probably, we, we definitely um, and most certainly need a lot of new and fresh ideas who are fundamentally different um, to those um, who, you know, have brought us into this, uh, into this trouble. And I do agree, I don't actually think uh, we differ on that, Martin. Um, I totally agree that it's good to have, um, you know, cells and minorities who start and to kickstart um, uh, change management processes, but in the end, you know, um, we almost need everybody and the more we have on board, the better. So, you know, it doesn't require a start with everybody, but in the end it should, um, you know, open up into a mainstream movement and to a very basic and fundamental understanding what is necessary uh, to live synchronized with nature and in a, in a real sustainability uh, lifestyle and not only in, uh, in a pseudo uh, sustainability with uh, green painted walls and um, and lentils in, in, instead of uh, instead of uh, poultry. <laughs> okay, uh, Marco, you wanted to say something as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with all of that, that, really. I mean, if you think about our current political system, and I think in very many countries, you see that politicians really haven't done their job properly. Uh, and uh, if you understand as their job to protect sort of the welfare of the citizens in their countries, then sure enough, they should have uh, passed stringent climate regulation, stringent health regulation, because uh, I mean, fundamentally, everybody wants to have good health and good environmental conditions, and they utterly fail on that. And I suppose if, if you think why they fail on that, then you have lots of things where sort of the whole makeup of how uh, policies are made uh, is really not up to scratch at the moment. And I can only also echo the plea for everybody to sort of keep up the pressure and join demonstrations to make sure to show politicians that there is actually some agreement uh, to, to the fact that we need climate regulation. Um, and just if you think about public health, um, I think some comments uh, in the chat were, well, it, 
maybe the planetary health aid is not stringent enough even, right? But if you think about how stringent it is for red meat, it's already a 90% reduction compared to what high income, what is eaten in high income countries. So it's a major change of what people on average eat. Um, and from all what we know about behavioral interventions in public health, uh, you won't get that from sort of this traditional idea that, oh, uh, uh, scientists or politicians just provide information and it's up to the individual consumer to take it on board or not. From all what we know is behavioral change when it comes to diets and anything else really only works when there are multiple, um, uh, multiple policies and multiple reinforcing measures put in place. And that starts with... Um, having the right dietary guidelines, having proper regulation of businesses so they can't produce and sell crap to consumers, um, having uh, uh, rules of what can be offered in canteens and having a proper price mechanism where prices of foods reflect their environmental and health impacts. And both of those things on, uh, on prices are utterly missing. So when you know, people make a purchasing decision uh, within the marketplace, and I guess we will always be in some kind of marketplace, then at least you can uh, demand that they have the full information to see what impact their consumption decision actually uh, uh, has. So there are lots of things that can be done within the current system, but the current system really has to be shaken quite a bit, and we must not get tired of calling for those changes. So Marco, you mentioned the canteens before. Um, that fits to uh, a question uh, which is any chance to get planetary health diets into official nutrition recommendations? Yeah, actually at the moment we're working on a big piece of research mm -hmm. where we compare the planetary health diet and other uh, dietary recommendations uh, to national food-based dietary recommendations. And what we find there is, uh, I mean, most of those have been somewhat designed that they should be broadly healthy. And we indeed find that, that in many, very, uh, in many cases, they would definitely be healthier than what people currently eat in the individual countries. But if you look at the uh, environmental impacts, they're not nearly as uh, stringent or stringent enough to get you on a, uh, uh, on a two degree pathway if everybody would eat in that way. And I think the buddies that set up those dietary guidelines, well, they didn't have that on the radar at all, right? Uh, and uh, I think once the new uh, set of guidelines are developed and uh, many high income countries have sort of a process, uh, a regular process by which those are updated every couple of years. And I think we, we should really make sure that the next iteration includes considerations, not only of health, but also of sustainability. Yeah, um, I. <laughs> someone also commented about uh, the quality of food served uh, in U.S. hospitals. I think <laughs> this applies to all the hospitals out there, at least in Germany. I guess. Um, come, to, come to Oxford; it's not better. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a to it's a total disaster, and and yeah. I find this. Uh, you know, we have talked to the Charité management who were actually quite open uh, to, to an idea of, of changing uh, uh, food and, and nutrition in the hospital and also at Emmanuel Hospital. But you can't imagine how difficult it is to, to get things done. And once again, you know, um, economy is a main driver here. Yeah? And it's not health uh, uh, rationales uh, that are, you know, the fundamental drivers and should be the funda fundamental uh, drivers for uh, choices um, of what kind of foods you, uh, you, you serve in hospitals. And it's absolutely fascinating, shocking, you know, horrifying to see that, uh, uh, and this is really true from my perspective, that hospitals in Germany and probably in most other countries uh, all around the world are probably uh, the the uh, public places that actually serve the worst kind of food, I mean, and those they should be temples for um, uh, for for food and nutrition because we know from science for for and we have known it for such a long time that nutrition is such an important factor for so many health conditions. And what we do, we serve you know the most awful, highly processed food, you know, mountains of. Um, of uh, animal-based foods, you know, refined um, carbohydrates, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, trash all over Europe uh, and, and, and most other countries, and we need to change this. I mean, this is also a matter of authenticity 
when we're talking about uh, practicing healthcare in hospitals and elsewhere, you know, we need to serve healthy food to the people, you know, come what may. And um, this is an, this is absurdistan, you know, to, to see that hospitals, uh, hospitals belong to the places that actually serve worst food. I mean, this is um, probably changing and there are some, um, some nice developments that we're seeing particularly in, in the US and uh, also starting in Germany in some hospitals but uh, much needs to be done, particularly there. You know, it's our responsibility as uh, medical professionals and stake, uh, stakeholders uh, in the healthcare systems, you know, to change this absurdity. I mean, I, I give you an example that perhaps we can use to also look back at the diet. Um, I know that for at least 10, 15 years, people have been trying to advocate for energy saving hospitals. In other words, to be a bit more greener. We have now stopped to talk about energy saving hospitals, but more about zero emission health sector, because it is a moral question. Once we see what the crisis is we are in, that you then have to stop behavior that leads to a further destruction of the planet. So it's not enough to be a bit greener. We really need to define a road to health sectors that's zero emissions. And the same is true with diet. We need to have healthy food and it needs to be food which is completely compatible with climate protection and biodiversity protection. And all other things are not acceptable any longer. And I think from there, from this stance, we then talk to the Charité and others, and in the beginning, they will think we are crazy, but if more and more students and employees are going there and saying we are not accepting it any longer, they will see it's also a competitive factor for them to have good staff and good patients, that this will be a mandatory thing for everyone. So it looks like crazy when I'm saying this now, but I'm sure this is the only way we go, because a bit better diet is not good enough. Yeah, I think uh, that question of um, the impact uh, that the um, uh, whole medical system has in terms of carbon um, emissions, that is, was also a question uh, raised here in the group. And I'd like to forward that question as well to Christian, who is working, uh, you know, in the field. Um, so uh, you mentioned before that you also have uh, some thoughts about how hospitals can operate on a more sustainable, in a more sustainable way. Can you give us some examples? Yeah, it's probably more a dream. I mean, it basically refers to what I said before, you know, we have to get out of this, um, you know, the treadmill um, you know, of the, the, of the growth paradigm, you know, because if, if we are in a system where only growth is actually um, uh, uh, the ultimate goal um, in the healthcare sector, then we're doing a lot of useless stuff. And there are so many publications out, you know, uh, you know, nutrition is only a, a very minor aspect of this. All, but if you, if you look at uh, a lot of surgery, a lot of interventional medicine that is being done, you know, we know from so many studies and from, from so many previous debates, you know, that a lot of what is being done in the healthcare sector actually doesn't make much sense medically or is actually not indicated. Yeah. And um, I mean, uh, it doesn't require a lot of uh, understanding, you know, to see um, that this is a, a major source um, of, uh, of, of, of a waste of resource, you know. And we're uh, and the patients are not even benefiting from it, but we're just using enormous um, amounts of medical resources all over the planet to perform probably useless um, uh, interventionalism based on um, on uh, on uh, on primary uh, economic rationales. And I think that is uh, very important, you know, that we um, that we um, uh, also reboot. Uh, you know, this um, uh, whole bundle of, uh, uh, of strange concepts um, in order to uh, make use of our resources wisely and um, um, invest more in areas that, are, that have been totally neglected, you know, like lifestyle medicine, uh, you know, particularly in the field of nutrition or, mind, you know, mindful, uh, mind-body medicine or, um, or movement, educate people to just live a healthier and uh, sustainable life, not only for themselves, but also for societies and for the planet. And we should invest uh, the, uh, more 
there and uh, cut down um, on, um, you know, e primarily economically driven medicine. You know, I can just uh, go on and, and, and repeat this over and over again, because this is at least my primary finding from, you know, the fallout of all these crises that are currently going on, on, on globally when it comes to my profession, you know, that we um, uh, need to uh, think over, you know, what is really necessary um, for our patients, for us and for the planet. And not only, you know, for, um, uh, you know, for the shareholders of uh, the companies we work for, um, and for for business and probably for our own bank accounts or whatever you know it's um, um, yeah it's a it's a big um, task for us but we have to tackle it anyway I think Christian there's a, it's very important there is a, mo uh, an, a window of opportunity through the corona crisis because there's an understanding that we need to reboot public health we need to revisit all the tendency going into a more economic most, uh, model. I think there's a lot of understanding now that if you're going more in an economic model, you will buy more risk. And you see it in the States where you have much more economic models than we have with a health care sector that is, that is delivering much worse results now for the broad uh, uh, public. So I think there's more understanding that we need to go back from the direction of economics. So I think we will have many, many discussions within the health sector and in the society in the, in the years to come around what kind of health sector do we want to have. And I think the understanding is there that a, a fully economized model is not doing what we need. Okay. Totally agree. There, there are lots of um, applauding hands and hearts popping up in the uh, chat room right now to all of you guys. <laughs> so I'm just uh, <laughs> sending the applause to you verbally now. Um, and there's uh, also one interesting question that probably um, um, is interesting for everybody listening and, and watching right now. Like imagine you were uh, a medical student um, aiming to become um, a sustainably working doctor? Like, what would your recommendations be? Marco, do you want to start first? I mean, that was my question when I was a medical student, because uh, in, my <laughs> clinical years, in my clinical years, I saw that something was, was wrong. And in the beginning, I thought, I'm wrong. Probably it's me. The others are doing fine. I'm the wrong guy here on the block. And then after some time, I found out, no, it's not me. Actually, there's something fundamentally missing within the health sector, which is number one, an understanding of how we, as human beings, kind of function, kind of that we are basically relational beings. So it's very much about the art of communication and treating each other and understanding each other, not just uh, uh, doctor patients, but also the teams. And then also to understand how do you shift uh, uh, health system structures. And in the way, the realization that I wanted to have a different medicine brought me on my journey. And I, I just uh, uh, encourage you to follow your heart and to follow your journey and you find your ways. And I recommend that you join in our Planetary Health Lecture Series because you really will get lots of inspiration from really great speakers, um, but follow your heart. I mean, just say different things are possible and you will find your way. I have found mine. Okay, Mark. I mean, if, I, if I can just add to that. So I'm not a medical doctor, right? But uh, anytime that I uh, was in contact, was in uh, at, at a doctor's office or so, and uh, uh, especially after I had changed my diet based on uh, research and became more plant-based, uh, I think the very minimal thing that I would have hoped from doctors is to not stand in the way, right? Back in the days, there was still all this discussion of, oh, if you, if you go plant-based, you know, you're malnourished, you will die and all those things, right? And that obviously comes because lots of uh, medical doctors don't get much education on uh, 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 non-communicable diseases, uh, prevention, uh, and all, the, all of those things, right? So I think if you're studying medicine now, really demand a bit more, uh, a bit more stuff on really uh, the dietary 
impact of uh, 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 both the health impacts, but also the environmental impacts of food choices and not just uh, sort of nutritional aspects, whether you get enough, I don't know, uh, vitamin, whatever, but also what are really the well-known uh, relationships between food groups and chronic disease risk uh, and, and uh, greenhouse gas emissions, for example. So I think that would be one of the most uh, beneficial things you can demand as a student. It's also a nice exercise um, that I have done recently, you know, to ask yourself the question, you know, how do you want to be remembered, you know, once, you know, once you're gone, you know, just a theoretical experiment that you can do, you know, um, uh, how do you want to be remembered as, uh, as an individual professional or as a community of professionals, as a medical doctor or a nurse or a dietitian or whatever you may uh, work in, you know, and, um, and that's an interesting experiment to see, you know, what kind of things arise in your mind and um, what kind uh, of goals, aims, and visions uh, arise out of this question. And I can just really encourage you to get engaged, um, to um, go out and um, find the community you want to be part of and be active and join all these fantastic organizations. Um, for example, like Kluge or Penn, you know, I really want to encourage uh, all the medical students and all the medical professionals, you know, directly related to nutrition to get engaged in Penn, you know, who is hosting this uh, session today also, and um, be part of uh, societal change management. It's always better to be part of an active and effective team than by just sitting on your couch and um, being sad about all the developments and, and uh, silently envisioning you know, what could be done and instead, you know, join uh, what's already out there, be part of it and get things done together with all those people and uh, this growing crowd of, um, of colleagues um, and, and wonderful people out there who want to do similar things yet, like you might want to do. Yeah, be active. It's the only way to, to get things done. That's, that's, I think this is a very good point to, to be active, to, come, to interact, to, to build networks uh, as you're doing already. Um, can you, uh, uh, Christian, can you um, also give um, the practitioners um, among the viewers here some advice um, on how to, uh, let's say, encourage uh, the patients to change their lifestyle to the better? Do you have any strategies how to win them for this idea to, you know, live a more sustainable, more healthy lifestyle? Yeah, that's a big question, probably um, uh, a bit too difficult to answer in a Q&A session, looking at the time frame. But also there, I can just recommend, you know, um, uh, inform yourself at first. You know, if, if you are well informed and you, if you are part of such organizations like Kluge or PAN or, or ProVeg or, you know, just... Uh, a, a private uh, circle of colleagues um, who, who teach and to inform each other, you know, um, only then um, uh, you can be a good advisor for your patients. So this is certainly the first step. And, um, and uh, you know, the rest is practice and empathy. And, um, you know, um, most of the people having undergone a university training in, uh, in a medical school know you know, how to get messages across. We just have to send and get new messages across. And this is actually not very difficult, yeah? You just need to know what you want to teach your, uh, your students or your patients um, or your friends and um, how, how this can be done effectively, you know, without dogmatism, without extremism, without, you know, a know-it-all attitude, you know, that really, um, really is appalling for a lot of people. And you have to, you know, develop strategies to win over your patients, you know, to to um, to take them by their hands, you know, at least when Corona is over, you know, we can't do this right now, but when it's over, we can take them by their hands and, um, uh, and uh, do this journey together, you know, instead of just uh, giving them homework and letting them alone, you know, with uh, what we want them to do. So this is, a, this is certainly a process and um, it requires love and affection and, and care, but this is already there with, um, uh, with most of the colleagues, you know, who are joining, I'm sure. And uh, it doesn't require special, um, uh, you know, special um, re uh, prerequisites other than being well informed um, about uh, healthy nutrition or whatever you want to get across. 
And here uh, is a little tip by one of the viewers uh, who had just used a nice image that you might want to use, <laughs> depending on the patient that you have in front of you. Uh, Lisa Marie Sicher said, I like the picture of a car, only the right fuel lets us work properly and your psyche is part of your body. So, uh, and I, <laughs> it's just like a... Nice idea in between. So uh, to slowly come to an end of this discussion, um, uh, I hear, I can tell here by um, the comments here, lots of people, by the way, are applauding uh, to you for um, um, mentioning um, the well, profit maximization um, that uh, is also part of our health system, obviously. Um, so that whole political economical aspect uh, is of course uh, another topic for another discussion i'm afraid we won't be able to solve that question uh, tonight but maybe um, each of you wants to give um, us an, an in your opinion um, an one effective measure or like maybe the most effective measure that everybody of us can take to contribute to climate health. Uh, Marco, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I mean, I guess I mentioned it already. I think the most effective way is really to, uh, uh, at least when we talk about the intersection of health and climate change, to uh, talk about dietary change and essentially try to be as plant-based as possible without being ideological, right? Um, so I think if everybody keeps that in mind and uh, doesn't get too much into moralistic arguments, uh, um, I think uh, we can have a joint discussion where we, where we see where uh, people can, can go to, really. Okay, Martin? Yeah, I mean, I've said it before, I think the main point is to get active, to be a change agent. And I want to introduce one concept, the so concept of social tipping elements. We, most of you will know the tipping points that lead to disastrous developments when certain natural dynamics, nonlinear kind of tip into a field where you cannot get it back. Now uh, we have this negative, but also in the social field, you have positive pandemics that spread throughout the world. And uh, we can all be part of potentially triggering a positive pandemic. In the beginning, it looks very small, but it is possible also to have nonlinear dynamics like the selling of the iPhone was one of them, but there are many others which were after them and people are infected by it. They cannot go back to imagine how it was before. So I think it's, uh, I, I, I'm very clear that the social tipping element, one can be the health sector. So you can be participating in making this a nonlinear positive change for the whole planet. And uh, that's my vision. And I invite everyone to join in and be an author of this movement. Okay, Christian, your last words. <laughs> Um, a chunk of this panel. <laughs> reduce, um, embrace, love. Full stop. Ah. Uh, okay. So um, I'm transferring the applause by uh, the viewers to you guys again. Um, that was uh, very beautiful. Thank you very much for uh, this lively discussion. Thank you very much for following. Um, I imagine that all of us, we've spent um, enough time in front of the screen um, for the past weeks already. <laughs> and now doing this on free will on a Sunday night. Um, you know, this is already the first step uh, on the way to um, becoming more active. And uh, now um, I think Niklas is going to tell us a bit about uh, VegMed again. And he's going to wrap it up uh, nicely as he has uh, done before. And um, I thank you very much for following the debate tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone again. Uh, thank you very much, um, <clears throat> Marco, Martin, Christian, and Dörte for that uh, very, very um, lively and, and inspiring um, panel discussion. Thanks a lot. I especially liked all the parts about uh, all the questions uh, that were there and the respective answer on, uh, answers on how to get engaged, how to get active. And um, I would like to um, 
by summing the, uh, up the last three days very, very quickly, just it will be two minutes. Uh, I would like to give you some more reason to, to get active and then uh, share the respective uh, websites and network information on a different organizations with you. So we did, uh, as we, uh, during the last three days, we did actually talk about uh, most of the top five Double, uh, um, uh, global health threats defined by the World Health Organization as um, the four of them you'll see here in blue are interconnected with food and food systems. So um, we touched on chronic disease with Dr. Walter Willett and we do know from the Global Burden of Disease study that poor diet causes more deaths than any other risk factor. And this is without malnutrition, which you see here on um, um, in the list as well on number eight, I think. So the poor in poor diet, uh, as we know, is uh, the fact that we do consume and do eat uh, not enough whole plant foods. So you do need a, a few other things, of course, to have, a, to have an optimal diet, but that is uh, kind of the main part of it. Uh, and most of the people aren't following it. And it is the um, common denominator with the other um, global health threats uh, I just showed you. Because um, we know that our food system, especially intensified agriculture and livestock production, is as well a key part in the emergence of zoonotic diseases and respective pandemics. And we, the same goes for um, antimicrobial resistances, um, where most antibiotics in this world are consumed by animals and not humans. Um, and today we just had this great discussion about the impact of uh, food production, food systems, mainly animal agriculture on uh, uh, global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and the numbers tell that we do need a lot uh, to do to um, reduce at least or prevent the climate crisis but we cannot do so without um, reducing animal foods and transforming our uh, food systems. So um, we got all the good reasons to um, make nutrition a key part of healthcare systems. We got all the key reasons to, to, as health professionals, support this transformation of food systems. And uh, it would be great if uh, we and all of you could carry this um, energy um, to VegMed 2021, um, very warm uh, invitation again to be part of this conference. Um, and of course, we don't want to wait to get active and to become the change agents um, we talked about. So um, there are, of course, the social media channels of VegMed conference uh, itself, uh, of the Physicians Association for Nutrition, ProVeg International, um, Emanuel Hospital in Berlin, and um, then there is the, um, um, the chance, of course, to become a member of Klug as well uh, at klimawandel-gesundheit.de um, and to join the Planetary Health Academy as well, uh, which is conducted by Klug. Um, Yes, w one last thing, because it was mentioned, uh, the, 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 so there are a lot of great projects, one project, was uh, mentioned uh, in the in the um, interview uh, in the panel discussion. Sorry, it was it's about um, plant whole food plant based food in hospitals. And if you uh, have a look at the um, Pan or ProVeg website, you will find a manual for hospitals um, to um, change their to change the food in hospitals. So that might be something of interest for you as well. So now. Um, Thank you very much for uh, participating in today's event. Thank you very much for um, having participated in the whole series. Um, as Dota said, the um, webinars were uh, recorded and will be published uh, next week on uh, VegMed social media. So make sure um, you got these and tell your friends, family, and colleagues um, to watch, hopefully. Thanks to everyone um, who participated today. Thanks to the great panelists and our host, Dörte. Um, I wish you a very good evening and a great start for the next week. Goodbye.